You have uh, lots of men workers over yeah. at your house right now, right? Too okay. Well, do. That doesn't sound too awkward. Anyway. Don't worry about noise. If you need me, let me know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll be okay. It, we're just gonna make fun of it. It's no big deal. I'm recording a podcast. We're gonna make so. fun of you too. Uh, <laughs> what's your What's your second child's name? That might be important for the jokes <laughs> we're gonna be making. <laughs> um, so, guys, you might hear a lot of drilling and banging. So, just treat it like it's a normal Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> this is Epic Battle Cry Skirmish 198 Drilling and Banging! Hello and welcome to Epic Battle Cry. This is the place where we cut through the crap to bring you the real deal in the gaming industry today. Cutting through something. I, I am your host, Tony Grice, and with me is Brent Adams and Tom Tim the Toolman Taylor. <laughs> 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 Daniel Kaiser has got something going on. I knew he said something about having a bunch of uh, bunch of uh, workers over there, That's but I'm not right. really sure what they're doing. DK, what you doing this week, man? I'm doing great, TG in 3D. I, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm a proud new homeowner here in Colorado, and uh, of course, with that comes a little bit of uh, uh, construction. Like you said, Tim the Toolman Taylor uh, is here and working on the house. So if you hear some noise in the background, that is not me. Um, heard it's uh, not you getting drilled in the background. That's not me getting <laughs> drilled. That's me building a uh, an addition for Don Matrick, who I've just recently hired uh, to be a part. <laughs> Yeah, I heard um, he's going to be looking for a new place soon. So your life's be, been going so well that you just wanted to bring something in to kind of even it out a little? Kinda, <laughs> yeah, balance it out, but we'll talk about that more. But to answer your question in a nutshell, I'm doing great and uh, uh, looking forward bad. to this week's show. <laughs> All right, so Brent, how you doing this week, man? <laughs> What's up? My patriots are pummeling. My revolutionaries of Rampage. Nice. How art thou? Boy, a very patriotic themed <laughs> intro from Mr. Brent Adams this week. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Thank you. I thought you might enjoy that. Of course, it's uh, as we're going to talk about. It's it's the Independence Celebration yes! episode. What a great pun! On. Who came up with that? I couldn't possibly imagine. I wonder oh. if it's the guy that's been punishing us for yeah, yeah, yeah. almost five years now. I have. I have. Hey, by the way, are you playing with fireworks? Uh, you can't do that here in Colorado because the state will burn. But what What about you guys? Uh, not yet. I mean, oh. I, like, I, I'm not sitting here with a Roman candle, like, you know, aimed at anybody's <laughs> face at the moment. But <laughs> not at the moment. we'll rectify that situation in the next 48 hours. What about you, TG? Oh, well, you know, after I lost those four fingers last year, <laughs> I, uh, it's just so much harder to hold them now. So. That's yeah. true. <laughs> Weird the way that, that works. Yeah. All right. Well, so we got plenty to go through in this uh, Independence-inspired uh, skirmish, so let's go ahead and run through the gauntlet. Gauntlet! All right, guys, we are here in the gauntlet, and we've got a couple of interesting stories. The first up of which is a, uh, a really kind of interesting move, uh, in, not in just in terms of who is uh, moving from one company to another, but also the timing of it. Mm -hmm. uh, Brent, you want to tell us a little bit about where Don Matrick is uh, at these days? Who fucking knows at this point? Here today, <laughs> gone tomorrow. That is the story on Don Matrick. Of course, Don Matrick formerly president of interactive entertainment business at Microsoft, and of course really the face of the Xbox One launches. He was prominently featured in both the Xbox One Reveal press conference as well as Microsoft's E3 press conference. It turns out that the man who was steering the ship on the most arguably <laughs> the most successful consumer hardware device Microsoft has ever released is now the CEO of the company that makes words with friends. Yay. Congrats on the promotion, Don. Can't <laughs> imagine what might have led to this sudden career change for you. So uh, <laughs> while everybody is all smiley faces and rainbows, making out like this is a great thing and it's such a great move Make up out? for uh, for Don Matrick, I think that... Um, I think that we all know that what happened here is that uh, Matrick did a big 180 on the success of the Xbox, and Zynga was like, hey, we're headed straight for the shitter. We could use a 180. Get that guy in here. <laughs> so um, that's what happened. So yeah, Don Matrick out at uh, Microsoft and has officially taken over as CEO at Zynga Games yeah. and is going to uh, try to be... 
I don't know, basically going to be trying to uh, to turn that ship away before they hit the iceberg, which uh, may not be too far. Zynga's had a lot of trouble lately. They've had, uh, of course, some highly publicized layoffs, yep. and uh, th- they're they're basically struggling right now as a company. And, so. and maybe not a bad idea, because Don obviously knows exactly where the iceberg is at this point. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I mean, I mean, like, honestly, he's probably like, look, I was just down look, that way. I just I hit that exactly shit a while back. I know exactly where it's at. I can get you around it completely. <laughs> so what do you guys, what do you guys think about this is there any is there any doubt in anyone's mind that matrick has been dismissed over the fact that basically every single policy that he probably put in place that you know he supervised for the xbox one has been reversed and he's basically turned uh the microsoft xbox into the laughing stock of the gaming industry i i'm overstating that i mean yeah no i I think you might be overstating it a tiny bit but maybe (laughs) maybe not too far off but go ahead he's been in the business for 30 years he's got a lot of experience he's done a lot of things particularly at electronic arts and you see a lot of uh the fruits of his labor in, in key franchises like fifa and need for speed and the sims and things like that but you know most importantly at xbox what he was like you said at the helm of the ship during their biggest growth period um i don't always look at the ceos and you know credit them one-to-one with, with stuff i mean it's like you know uh it's a series it's of events just but, one person you know, you know yeah it's not just one person but you do have to credit uh the the you know uh the the leaders for steering the ship in that direction um but what's interesting to me is that as somebody who's been a part of that this should be the most exciting time for xbox and i think what happened at e3 just really put a a nail in the coffin of the whole um, kind of uh, engine of enthusiasm if you will there's Mm -hmm. there's there has to be some level of of um, you know uh, him being distraught about what happened at E3 that has translated into him saying okay now I guess I just need to transition into something different Um, because you don't think that he was asked to go no, he was recruited by Zynga, yeah. and well, I don't I mean, think he I was know that that's what they're saying happened, but I mean, you don't think that like <laughs> people at Microsoft were like, you know, we hear you got a job offer from Zynga. Maybe you should take that. No, I, well, you know, I, I think these things exist all the time in business. Like people drop, you know, like, hey, if you ever want to, you know, mull around this idea, then here you go. I think he, I think after E3, he probably started exploring, like heavily exploring past opportunities that he maybe never entertained. And this right. one just kind of came to fruition really fast. And he said, well, you know what, he's going to put a good face on it. But at the end of the day, they, I mean, this, if you're that embedded and that invested in that brand, this is the most exciting time to get it to its next phase. And so to jump ship now, just a couple of months before the thing comes out, something is, he's, he's really had to have a change of heart. Well, and wasn't the or rumor Steve that Palmer appara- really, really had to have fired him. Correct. Either, either or, but I think it's the, the former, not the latter. Wasn't, wasn't the, the rumor though, like I think all things D, like who kind of, I think was the first one to bring the story yeah, said that it. he'd actually been in talks for quite some time with Zuniga. Do you, you think this could actually maybe be the other way around that Microsoft knew possibly it was going to be taking quite a bit of heat for some of the choices they were making on the Xbox one and said, Hey, look, you know, one of the last things you got to do before you go is it's kind of take, take to fall on your sword a little bit here. That yeah. gives you, you know, that, you know whatever it is that way and you know they probably at that point maybe didn't even know that they were going to do this reversal that they've kind of done since on a lot of those key things but you know at that at that point maybe they they thought like hey look we know that this is going to be kind of rough maybe not as rough as they thought but we know this is going to be pretty rough so uh, you know rough. hey since Just you're the way your mother likes it Trebek. you're thinking about go ahead and, and heading on anyway so maybe maybe you kind of you know take take it on the sword and then you know I, to be honest with you the same way with uh uh Zuniga, like i think they they had like a a good opportunity to maybe bring someone in who, frankly, I, I think you're right, DK, that, you know, it's not like this guy doesn't have a lot of um, history in the industry and a lot of knowledge yeah. and frankly knows how to run, you know, I think a, a, a good uh, division of a, of a, of a gaming related company. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's, we kind of make fun of the timing, but I also wonder if this wasn't just one of those things where the timing actually just happened around some things that make it look worse than it maybe really was. That's a possibility. I mean, I, it, it would be to, for him to be the fall guy for them and then be able to exit and then kind of get a clean slate would, would be ideal for Microsoft. Um, what if he, I, I would love to see like the kind of bonus that he got like for leaving. Like, I mean, if it, to me, it would be, it would be really telling. Like if he kind of like left on and just got whatever he was normally scheduled to get, if he ever left the company or if he got some sort of like, you know, bonus for, you know, 
hey, well, so because of the last year's so profitable for us, here's a little extra or something. That would kind of say a lot to me as to where, whether he did take one for the team or whether he just his his last away. public act on behalf of the company was that open letter saying that we are basically reversing all of our policies based on fan feedback so i mean that's yeah. that's his last like kind of defining moment within a company and an organization that he helped uh you know direct to prominence so that's pretty that's that's a valid point i don't i don't know it'd be very interesting to find that out maybe someday somebody will make a documentary and all the truth will be called beyond the box <laughs> or inside the box, or right. boxed up and we, we get it. There's going to be there's going to be yes, there'll be something the about a box. Yeah, so, okay. Right, we understand we understand what you're saying. All right. So last question: Do you guys? Uh, l- let's assume for a second. Let's assume for the second that there was some sort of long long term vision behind Matrick leaving, and it wasn't just a spur of the moment. <laughs> like he woke up on Wednesday and realized, "Wow, I just sunk the Xbox yesterday, he, didn't I?" Zinga. Um, <laughs> so, assuming that there was some sort of long-term kind of thing to it, let's just assume... Well, actually, no, we don't even have to assume that. Just given the situation that Microsoft is in, with the the, the, the reaction from gamers to the Xbox One, the reversal of all those policies, does this help Microsoft? Does Matrix, who was, I, I think, certainly the face of yes. the Xbox One launch, does the fact that he is no longer with the company, does that in any way help Microsoft yeah. and the Xbox One at this point, do you I think? I think so. I think well, but so. But he was also I, the guy that did the reversal. So wouldn't that kind of, wouldn't it have been better for him to leave and then have someone else like Steve Ballmer come in and say, you know, hey, look, or oh, whoever's yeah, going to be, be running. Better, but yeah. yeah, exactly. So I, yeah, I don't know. I, I do think that it helps... I, you know, to be honest with you, I think it may just help to get a new vision in there because let's be honest with you, I think the vision that they're putting forth that they were really wanting to do is not really on the same page with a lot of you know right. a lot of their but customer if, base. If so this the gives case, them just a fresh gonna start. To, they're going to have to say that, aren't they? Aren't they going to have to say, you know what? Uh, we're gonna we're gonna be pursuing a different vision than what we'd yeah. originally laid out because we, well we I would say they probably that, will over the next coming months because you don't want to back away from something you spoke again this could have gone totally different had they like we talked about last week had they presented it differently but they do Tony you're right have an opportunity to use this to to, to better themselves um, because he is associated with all that negativity surrounding yeah. the reveal um, you know again though it would have been ideal to have somebody else introduce the changes because it would have been a clean slate somebody that was remaining with the company but I see this as only being something that could be skewed positively to answer your question I don't see how it could be negative um, unless you know someone else comes in and goes you know says that they need to readapt some old policies or whatever but that's not going to happen we're, we're talking a lot about about you know him leaving uh, Microsoft, but I, I do think that this says also a lot about uh, uh, Zaniga and like their Zynga. you know kind of Zynga yeah. What's, Zynga yeah however you pronounce it uh, is and and the fact that you know the founder has been the CEO as far as I know as, as long as the yes. company's been around Correct. and has really caught a lot of flack because you know I think at one point weren't they they had like a bid to you know sell you know to somebody else for like a really high amount or something they they turned it down and then they started buying up other companies and now essentially yeah. they've kind of pissed away all that so like oh, uh, yeah, it kind of kind of says something. You know that you know he's how bad is that guy that he's getting you know this this replacement you know well, uh, although he's he's still on the board of directors and everything I know but I, I, just my two cents before uh, just to say I think that his he actually is probably better suited for this role than he is at Microsoft because what he was trying to do at Microsoft was capture the casual capture the mainstream capture some of those things with what we saw and pioneer through technology and products uh, you know to to develop a brand to to skew a, a, a brand that already had an identity to skew it towards the more casual. Zynga needs to do that. They, they have been, you know, the product of this very quickly changing market of mobile gaming and social media. And so, you know, he, his skill set and also his vision probably is better suited for Zynga. So I think this actually is going to help them significantly. That. But, I agree with uh, you know, I, I, it's it's hard to tell until some things are implemented. But you know, th- they were at one point the kings of what they were doing there on on social platforms. Sure. It's just that it changes so fast and people are so finicky. So I think that it's more like Matrix could help them hit a few home runs and consider his job well done, as opposed to this long term plan with the Xbox that wasn't going over now, but might may go over several years down the road. Yeah. All right. It'd be interesting to find out. 
Uh, either way, I think that he'll 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 either speed up their demise or speed up their their uh, their yeah. profitability. I think one way or the other. I, I have a He's feeling that's the gonna, gas. You know, yeah, it's, it's exactly. all, it just depends on which way the shit's pointed at the time. It is. Yeah, exactly. He does uh, have a need right. for speed. Uh-huh. 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 Why did I stop for that? <laughs> All right, so <laughs> next up we have an announcement from uh, Clay Entertainment, and uh, they've announced their new game, uh, Incognita. DK, mm. you want to tell us a little bit about uh, what this game's about? It looks awesome. Just buy it yep. whenever it yep. comes have, out. Have basically. we even seen it yet? Next no. story. I don't okay. need to see Doesn't much. Matter. <laughs> Doesn't matter. I got a wallpaper. I'm done. No, okay, so... That's all, all you need anymore. That's all you need. Clay Entertainment, the folks behind Mark of the Ninja, Don't Starve most recently, and of course, Shank, um, you know, they are creating a new game that they recently announced, Incognita, turn-based tactical espionage. Uh, it is said that this game is a procedurally generated turn-based tactical espionage game, uh, which is one hell of a subtitle, but at the same time, it's very intriguing, borrows a lot from what we've seen from uh, the success of the uh, XCOM, Enemy Unknown, title which kind of reinvigorated the real time strategy genre turn, and in a recent interview with Rock strategy. Paper Shotgun uh, Jamie based. Chang of Clay talked about the amazing experience of XCOM which is mostly about planning and positioning and, and that moment of, of payoff where you have you know 90% positioning and then 10% information gathering and then you know you go in and boom here's this moment this climactic moment so they're saying they're replicating that um, but that they have a lot that they're, they're not really talking about but they say that information is going to play, the information that you gather and cultivate is going to play a very big role and a key part into the experience. So these guys have done a really good job of, of establishing themselves as having uh, a distinctive art style, of having well-developed ideas. I think that, you know, Shank 2 showed what they were ideas. Yeah, exactly. The, you know, I was initially worried when they went straight from Shank to Shank 2 that they might be pigeonhole, pigeonholing themselves as a, as a one-trick pony, but then you no. see Mark of the Ninja, which really kind of redefines stealth, and then they come up with this crazy off-the-wall shit with Don't Starve, and now they're to- the last thing I would have expected from them was a turn-based tactical espionage game, so good on them for being experimental and actually being extremely creative and, yep. uh, and trying to see what they could accomplish. This one is definitely on my watch list. Uh, it's slated for release on the PC uh, this summer, uh, late summer, and then also, also ultimately a Mac uh, uh, version as well. So what do you guys think of what we know, even though it's very little? Do you trust these guys with a, with a, a new IP like this and, and a genre that is outside of their realm of comfort? So you're telling me that the company that made Mark of the Ninja and Shank is now working on a game in the same vein uh, as... XCOM Enemy Unknown, except that it's a tactical espionage game. Just go ahead and take my money and yeah. hand me the paper towels. Yes. Because um, <laughs> I am about There's to make a, wallpaper a mess all over too, myself. There's a you get already. Um, <laughs> you heard that part. So, yeah, I, I, am, I am as excited over this announcement as I could be. Uh, I really, really like the game company that Clay Entertainment is evolving into. I like the fact that their games are very gameplay-focused titles. Mm -hmm. They have great... Uh, they have a great sense of creativity to their titles, but at the core of everything they've done has been a really compelling gameplay mechanic. It, a real throwback to classic gaming, in, in my opinion, yeah. where you know what set a title apart was some function of how you played the game that, that made it somewhat different from another platformer, for example. Um, yeah. So the fact that they have looked at XCOM Enemy Unknown, a game that as of this week I think I've played 115 hours of, Wow. Um, the fact that they've looked at XCOM Enemy Unknown and said, that is a fucking awesome game. You know what we could do is we could take that sort of idea and we could put a slightly different spin on it. And I love the idea that it is about, you know, that, that, that information is power in the game and that all of those things that they've talked about as far as this being an espionage, a tactical espionage title, I absolutely love that. I think that it will be a really, really great fit for their sensibilities and uh, I, I can't wait to uh, to actually check it out when the when, when they do release. Is it uh, is it the beta that's or excuse me the alpha? Is it the alpha is the thing that's going to be coming out later this summer, right? Yeah, I'm sorry. I think I might have mentioned. I, I was trying to correct that. So thanks for bringing it up. Uh, the the open alpha is slated for this summer. The game uh, we don't have any idea. Right. So anyway, I'll be very interested to check that out when it happens. And I'll also just say as a, as a final little thing that uh, I think it's. 
this this practice of companies, and I mean, obviously, Clay Entertainment's not the first to do this, but this practice of companies sort of you know putting out not just betas but alphas, like really really early versions of games, and really diving into the feedback that they're getting from their players from the community and and using that stuff yeah. to make to make the game better. I think I think it's a really good practice, and um, I think putting I, out is always a good practice. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, bottom line, I'm excited for Incognita. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I, the one thing you can say about Clay is I think they're you. You really have to respect a company that has come up with quite a few original IPs in a relatively short period of time that have all seen, I think, a a, a pretty good amount of either um, you know like commercial success like sold well or at least got some really good critical success you know what i mean yeah. like 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 every title they've put out has either um been you know critically received and you know has sold well or or has kind of had one or the other and you know i don't think that that's necessarily something you see all the time especially with this kind of the the sort of downloadable only style titles like you kind of feel like that's the kind of company that usually comes out with a game and if it sees any success they just make you know, a million sequels to it, or just keep yeah. adding on to it. And right. you know, they, they you know they did they did make uh, Shank two, but like I said, I, I think they actually they they stepped up they quite a bit when better, they made yeah. that. It, yeah. Exactly, it wasn't just a you know uh, a copy of the first one with with you know some new materials significantly uh, added onto it. So mm-hmm. uh, you know, you look at that and you look at Mark of the Ninja and um, Don't Starve things like that. I mean, they really they have a lot of uh, a lot of good uh, IPs that that they brought to the table, and this is just and, yet and, another and one just to add one to the list. Last compliment to them it's really unique in this day and age to have such diverse creative behind these games but there's something about their games their art style their presentation the way they do things where you could kind of guess like that's a clay game like you could look at it and very few very few creative entities whether it's a whether it's a game company or 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 a a a movie producer or a an a band very or a singer there's very few things that are so distinctive that you're like that's probably this and they've managed to do that just over a wide range of creative and genres so good on them for that yeah, if I ever see like orange shit up on the screen, I know that it's going to be a Michael Bay film. <laughs> you know, so there's very few people that can get, you know, just, just from just one shot, it. you can That's get right. it, you know. So, yeah, it's definitely true. All right, well, so uh, from one company that uh, has tried some uh, very new and interesting ideas with every IP, we go to a title that looks about as generic as humanly possible. Um, <laughs> But it's the best so, of E three, obviously. Oh well, yeah, it's the best of E three because it was the only fucking thing playable there. All exactly. right, so uh, we we find out who what the winner of the best of E three from all the different categories was uh, here recently. Brent, you want to run us down the list of who won? Titanfall, Titanfall, and more Titanfall. Um, as uh, as you guys were just saying, of course, uh, the reason that uh, the Titanfall has won the Game Critics Awards for this year's best of show at E3 uh, 2013. Lar- I think a large part of that is the fact that Titanfall was playable and that the game has to be playable in order to be considered for uh, any of these awards. Some other notables that aren't Titanfall, uh, the Oculus Rift was best hardware uh, peripheral, Watch Dogs was best action adventure game, Elder Scrolls Online best role playing game, Need for Speed Rivals best racing game, Best sports game went to NHL 14. Best strategy game, Total War Rome 2. And mm-hmm. uh, best uh, downloadable game was Transistor. So, Yay! Uh, but ev- everything else was Titanfall. Like, even, like, best social casual game, Titanfall. No, I'm just yeah. kidding. That was Fantasia. But anyway, yeah. um, without hating on this game, because I-, I know that, you know, there are some people who are really, really excited for it. And in fairness, I haven't played it, so I only have the uh, the media to go by. I have to say that I I think that people are more excited about this game because it's coming from Respawn Entertainment than yeah. anything that they're seeing in the actual game. At least to yep. me, like I'm looking at it and I I don't really see anything all that distinct or or different. I mean, yes, I understand that it has mechs, but um, I, I don't look at that game and, and say, wow, they've completely changed my right. definition of what a first person shooter is. Um, I think that people are more sort of excited about who's behind it rather than yeah. what the game itself represents. Yeah, that, they have a lot of faith in the kind of, yeah. yeah, the heritage of the company. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, two things on that point as they saw through my house, and you could probably hear it. Uh, <laughs> a, E3, E3 is the biggest event in gaming. It's the Super Bowl of gaming. And when you have the game critics, uh, the, the, you know, the, the uh, you know, kind of, 
compiling all the game critics to, to produce these awards. They need to do this better. It's time to change. E3 is all about the future and what's happening. The best playable game at E3 is a category. You, you can't really just kind of take that and apply it to every other category. Best in show, best original game, and just say only because games like The Witcher 3 and Destiny and Metal Gear Solid 5, those are, that's what people were talking about. I'm, yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly people right. were talking about Titanfall a lot as well, but it shouldn't get this much publicity and this much press as and win this many awards just because it was the one that was playable because some of those games might come out sooner than you expect and this one might come out later than you expect. It's not really about that. Like I said, best playable category is a category. Create it change it and change the rules so that we can have a, a, an honest reflection of what the biggest show in inter interactive entertainment is all about. That being said, I think you guys are right. And this is basically the evolution of Call of Duty, which has a gigantic fan base. And they're looking at how do we make this cooler and something unique. You throw mechs into the mix. It's always going to make things more interesting. There's a lot to learn about this game, the variety of mechs, the variety of, of player classes and things, and, and the relationship between everyone. The balance of gameplay is the thing I think is going to be the biggest interesting sure. thing for me. I mean, you yeah. throw in a bunch of giant mechs in there. Like, how how is that going to go against the dude that's you know, sitting there with the machine gun? Like, yeah, you know, and, we're, we're, and this uh, let's not. This is a multiplayer only game, so I mean, there's no single player experience to this thing, which is kind of like. I think it was uh, best voted best multiplayer game. No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's that's also like you know, for me, I looked at games of this vein. I, you know, I'm more excited about Destiny than this because I think if you're not a Call of Duty fan, you almost kind of initially write this one off because there is that tie there. There is that assumption that it's going to play and feel very much like Call of Duty. But right. anyway, um, this it's an exciting project and it'll be a big IP and they'll push the hell out of it and everybody else will too and I have no doubts it'll be a good game for what it is but uh, there's a lot of other fishing to see as well I hate that this one is taking up so much of the uh, um, of the space yeah, I don't know what it was exactly about Titanfall, but like, and, and you know, I'm, I I probably play some of the first person shooters more than either uh, yes, of you two. And, it's a and, and to conclusion. Be, to be brutally honest with you, I'm not necessarily um, not planning on playing this game. I just, there's something about it that just didn't, I didn't feel like it had much of a personality. Like, it just felt very generic to me. Like, I didn't, I, I don't know, I didn't see anything. Like, I mean, yeah, people were like, yeah, but it has mechs. I'm like, well, okay, but I mean, what, you know, that didn't, I, nothing about it just looked awesome to me or looked that that amazing to me but i think it benefited more than anything not even just because solely because it was playable it's just because this was a console launch e3 you know this was a an e3 where the the biggest star of the day were new consoles where in a lot of cases right. we're going to see titles that frankly aren't quite as done as they might be at a you know at say any other e3 like in the in the middle of a console's life cycle so i, I you know i think it sort of benefited from the fact that it was maybe a little bit further along in, in the development process than a lot of these other titles that frankly i think I, I think more people are excited about these other titles it's just that this one you know got the benefit of being the one maybe closest to being done or at least closest to, to having you know the, its playable form right. at the right. show so right eh, you know Good, good for them. I mean, whatever. It's you know, sure. I, I don't think they needed any additional. Uh, I don't think they need any additional attention on this title, but they got it. So uh, yeah, we don't uh, wish I, them any ill will. I don't think it's just that yeah. it, this kind of highlights one of the flaws of the game critics kind of thing. I think that that I don't know that playable thing is just a, a real stickler to me because it it, it yeah. discredits so much stuff. But anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, you never you never hope any titans of the industry will fall far from the. Uh, Point where oh, the, uh, drinking the pun juice. All right. So uh, last but not least, we've got a, uh, a little bit of news on the upcoming Grand Theft Auto V. Hey. Uh, Rockstar took to uh, took to the internets to uh, answer a few uh, few questions. DK, you want to kind of run us down what they told us? That's right. Uh, so they actually, in the latest edition of Asked and Answered, which is a feature that they do on the Rockstar website, they highlighted Grand Theft Auto V and talked about some of the things we can expect. The key elements of that were, uh, you know, we know there's these three protagonists in the game, um, Michael, Trevor, and Franklin, and basically how you interact with them was uh, was the focus of one question. They, they, It's very interesting, actually, because I think a lot of people coming in like, do I play just the entire story of one? Do I jump back and forth? So they shed some light, and 
and this is exactly what's going to happen. They're basically their own separate characters with their own lives and their own sets of friends. Um, Rockstar says that they they have their own ways of that they prefer spending their own free time. When you're not on a mission with one of them, uh, you can freely jump in between these three characters' lives, drop in and out of their lives to see what they're up to. And they emphasize the fact that because they have their own unique identities and their own schedules, that you'll uh, you'll you might find you know Michael in the middle of a family dispute. They said, or uh, Franklin chatting up some chicks, or Trevor uh, Trevor running down uh, you know trying to rob somebody or running from the law or whatever. Uh, but you can jump in between them, which is really interesting uh, when you're not on a mission. It's completely up to you how you do that. And they said, in addition. Basically, they all have their own side missions and their own main jobs that they'll be doing. And there's times when you will be utilizing multiple char- multiple characters of them, the three of them, uh, to, to accomplish a task. So it might be combinations of two of them, all three of them. Uh, so it sounds like there's a lot of diversity to how you'll be interacting with their worlds. And as we talked about early on, I think seeing how their lives and uh, gameplay intersect is going to be one of the more exciting aspects of this project because they're you know they're taking this gigantic world and this gigantic project and and making basically three games but also um, showing how these lives are ultimately going to intersect into the story they're trying to tell so that's an interesting component I want to get your guys thoughts on that but before that there were a couple of other details they said that uh, customization is going to be a very big part of you know uh, vehicle customization weapon customization they're expecting to uh, give us more details on that very soon and last but not least is the fact they gave some logistical data on the installation of Grand Theft Auto 5 if you own an Xbox 360 it'll come on two discs there's a mandatory disc uh, for installation which is the first disc Uh, it requires an Xbox 360 hard drive or an external 16 gigabyte USB flash drive which is needs to be USB 2.0 drive to use and it will it needs to have a, a minimum at least eight gigabytes of free space uh, in order to install that first disc. Once you do that on the Xbox 360, you'll only play off the second disc for both uh, offline and online play. Uh, and on the PlayStation 3, it only comes on one disc and it'll have an eight gigabyte, uh, roughly eight gigabyte install at the initial onset. And then from there, you play off of that disc um, whenever you want. So that is the main tidbits of information coming out of the Ask and Answered. What do you guys think about all that? Well, you know, it's it's kind of funny because I was talking with a friend of mine uh, over the weekend, and we were specifically talking about this this whole sort of three character, three main character approach that uh, Grand Theft Auto V is going to have, and how interesting it's going to be to see that gameplay mechanic uh, actually work in practice. And you know, Rockstar has talked about it a few times, but they still haven't shown it. And I'm very interested to see it demonstrated. I mean, I, I think I can certainly imagine some situations where it would be really, really interesting or, or really, really funny. I, I mean, you know, think about, you know, playing yeah. as, as Michael, for example, and, you know, you're kind of bumming around your house, you know, watching your dysfunctional family go about their day or whatever. And then, you know, you switch over to Trevor, who's, you know, screaming and like, you know, firing a fully automatic weapon out of the back of a pickup truck as he's, you know, running from like the county sheriff's. And just like you right. know, the juxtaposition of like you know, just instantly going from zero to 120, you know, I, I can I can see all kinds of like really really fascinating possibilities where you know you just uh, you just don't know what to expect and and how that could that could really make it interesting. So as far as as far as like those kinds of things, I definitely see how this could be appealing. My question. And the, the thing that I'm really anxious to find out about this game, given the fact that Rockstar, I think, are incredible storytellers. That's what has made the Grand Theft Auto series, as well as the other games that they've worked on, such as Red Dead Redemption, such compelling experiences. They are great storytellers. And I'm very, very fascinated to see what sort of story or stories that they are trying to tell where they feel like they need this mechanic in order to to do that to its fullest. So uh, right. there's still some question marks for me, but I, I have to say that I'm not really doubting them so much as I'm just uh, I'm just really, really anxious to find out firsthand what all of these descriptions look like in terms of gameplay. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Like, I think uh, I think the biggest thing is not necessarily like that we doubt how if Rockstar can pull it off, you know, because I don't, I don't think we 
really question that they can. It's just how will that kind of balance out in the gameplay? Because it does sort of seem a little like, you know, so, well, if you can just jump back and forth, like, wouldn't that throw, you know, I don't know, like, time yeah. of day off? Wouldn't that throw off, like, you know, where you're at? You know, if you've if you're played, like, 90% through one storyline and then you try to jump over to another character, it's like, surely that's going to be further along in it. I, yeah, I don't know. It just it seems like there's going to be some sort of... Um, disconnect between certain things but you know i i, I will uh, actually be really interested to see because i'm not a huge grand theft auto fan but i will say this one really has has got me interested because it does it just it just looks like fun i mean it just looks like it's going to be just a huge 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 world to 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 play in yeah. well and, and just one last point I, I think it'd be interesting to find out either before the game comes out or after it doesn't matter but whether it was the the concept of the story that begat the decision to to do this right. alternating thing or if it was the concept of creating this alternate gameplay scenario that begat the story did they you know did they get into a room at the beginning and the onset of development and say wouldn't it be cool if you could jump between characters that's going to be our big thing with grand theft auto 5 and then they developed a story around it or did they start weaving this story and, and at some point they were like you know what you need to have the player play all three and this is how it's going to work so i'd you be know, interested I, to find that out me too i would almost put money that they came up with the idea of like multiple storyline like characters first because i mean it's such a i don't know such a critical thing like I, I don't know that they it seems like that would have been something early on in the process but yeah that's a great that's a great question but and it also kind of seems like it could be sort of an evolutionary step beyond what we saw like in grand theft auto 4 and its dlc packs where you know grand theft auto 4 was about one character and then both of the big DLCs that were released for Grand Theft Auto 4 took That's place true. in the same world, but and, and you know and you know there was there was you know some some ties back to the main story, but you know they were about different characters doing their own thing. This sort of seems like you know taking that to the next logical conclusion in a way, sort yeah. of like Daniel's puns leading to homicide. <laughs> now, is it the guys hammering in the other rooms with their like like with a hammer or just them banging their heads into it? It's probably this? just or are they their banging head. something else entirely. Uh oh. Uh -oh. All right, guys, we're here in the main topic this week, and uh, with it, of course, being uh, Independence Day week, uh, we are going to have a topic around Independence Yay! Day. Play on words. Uh, <laughs> so what we're talking a little bit about is just the the indie market. You know, we've talked about it quite a few times, but uh, to be honest with you, it's it's getting just bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's actually been some some pretty big stories around it lately. DK, you want to tell us uh, a little bit about like you know what are some of the and you know, what are some of the really standout titles in the indie industry that are really uh, uh, getting the industry going? And and also like seems like there's a couple stories. I mean, you know, the the PS4 and the Xbox One both have had some kind of interesting developments around the indie development culture too. With it being Independence Day, TG and 3D, what better time in, to evaluate the state of the indie uh, sector of gaming? Now, obviously, indie games in years past, I think they've come a long, long way, and that's what we want to discuss. Not only the, the creative behind indie games, but also just their role and their relevance in the, uh, in, in the gaming world and interactive entertainment in general. You ask about titles, obviously, we've seen some really big ones, Journey, Bastion, Transistor, on the way, uh, both of those from Supergiant Games and, you know, Journey of course from that game company. Mark of the Ninja, uh, we talked about Clay a lot early on. Uh, now, these companies grow, they end up signing exclusivity deals on certain titles or whatever, uh, but they're not owned by, uh, you know, they're not a studio that is owned by a Microsoft or uh, a Sony or whatnot. So uh, what we have seen in stark contrast to that is those companies actually going out of their way to promote these, uh, these companies. And, you know, particularly at E3, Sony going way out of its way to let people know that they support the indie development scene. And I think the indie scene is actually critical in any medium because it, it, it is a, a realm in which you could take more chances, you could do things. I think that, you know, initially uh, it was uh, in the world of gaming, you didn't really have a, a shot at making an indie game in the last generation. It was only until this console generation. And, you know, let's, let's talk about Microsoft, you know, and their support through XBLA and, and, and they had the whole X and A development kind of thing and stuff initially with the onset. Uh, I think Sony's taking the lead a little bit more in terms of fostering an environment that would uh, give indie games their own portion of the store, show people uh, more prominently what's out there in terms of uh, you know development. But then you have whole consoles like the Ouya that's being fueled by the indie sector. So right now is an amazing time to be a, an independent game developer because you can knock it out of the park with a great idea. And we do 
see at GDC and a lot of these events, packs and things, there's whole sections dedicated to indie game development. Um, and then, of course, there's ways to facilitate the growth and production of your game with, with things like Kickstarter and, and Steam Greenlight. So um, I think right now is the most exciting time that there has ever been to be in the indie game development. Uh, but what do you guys think about its impact on the industry? With the increased exposure, have there become way more increased risks or do they still have that kind of Wild West mentality of, hey, let's think creatively first and worry about logistics second? Uh, or are they starting to get more business-like and starting to see you know, more competition on that level because uh, they are being able to be more monetized and successful as individual products, whereas they were mostly seen as just being um, you know, great creative entities in the past. So what do you guys think about the state of indie games on those, on those points? I think that, uh, first off, you're absolutely right, and I, I agree with you wholeheartedly that th there probably has never been a better time, and it's been very interesting to see the momentum of independent games really building uh, over the past few years, and, and fueled, I, I think, in large part due to the ability not only for word of mouth to spread so quickly you know, through you know, traditional gaming news websites, but also social media and whatnot, but also, if, you know, for the games themselves to uh, to spread that way as as well. I mean, certainly on the PC side, you know, indie games are are a real cornerstone. And and you know, there's, I mean, you know, you can download any number of games about anything, and uh, and play this on the PC. But to see a lot of those titles making their way to the console, and a lot of those titles being born on the console, you know, as is the case with something say, like Journey, or of course Bastion, you know, we, we, obviously that, that did come out on the PC as well, but, um, you know, there is a, there, there are certainly games that are, um, that are pushing the boundaries of what people expect out of, uh, out of their, their games that, uh, that are popping up all over the place, and to see the different ways that companies like Microsoft or Sony support independent games, the fact that Sony has made such a big deal out of the uh, the ability for game creators to self-publish on the PlayStation 4, the fact that Sony dedicated so much of their stage time yeah. at E3 2013 to independent game companies and uh, and the things that they're they're bringing to the table, I think is really indicative of the fact that, number one... Not you know it's not just that you know Sony sees these companies and say oh those are really good games let's let's promote those but I think that Sony is recognizing the fact that gamers are really really responding to yeah. those titles and those companies as well and I think the fact that you see and it's kind gamers, of a cool feather in the cap too like we support indie you know like it, you're going to sure, win over yeah. some fans and, and and that's the thing I think that I think that you know companies like Sony I think they are doing it. Out of because it's a way for them to appeal to gamers, which you know that they went out of their way to do this year. But uh, the of course the root of that is the fact that gamers are really excited about indie games, and I think that that's because AAA games, for better or worse, as they've as as they move along, they do tend to become um, a, a little watered down sometimes. They you know when you're playing with lots and lots of money, you play it safe. They tend to sort of be what you expect them to be. Because that's how they're able to recoup those massive costs. And so because indie games, uh, you know, cost far, far less, they can afford to, to take chances. They can afford to be really, really different. And the fact that gamers are responding to that, that gamers are seeking that stuff out, that they're supporting those titles, that they're getting excited and playing those games. I think that that is maybe the healthiest sign of all. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I would I would definitely agree with you. And something you kind of were you know talking about a second ago that Sony was doing is using this as sort of a differentiator between them and and Microsoft's kind of you know em embracing it even more so. And then also on news that you know Microsoft kind of came out and was sort of I don't know almost as if they were sort of downplaying you know they they actually kind of really were out there you know saying you know hey here's you can easily develop on X and A and all this sort of stuff. It, it's almost as if they sort of backed off of that a little bit when maybe they should have put their foot down and, you know, really embraced it even more so. I think Sony in the last generation, too, honestly probably got... You had a couple of, like, really big titles for Xbox, I guess, like like Minecraft, you know, even though that's not exclusive to the 360, it was exclusive to the console um, on, on the 360. And you, you kind of, you, you think, like, you know, they had a few things like that, but Sony had a lot of things, especially, you know, you look at, like, Journey and... Um, 
you know, they did uh, w- like the other games in like Flower and stuff like that. But they had mm-hmm. a, a couple of other uh, big tiles that really sort of um, had them stood out a little bit. It almost reminded me like of honestly, like the earliest days of video games, like before yeah. consoles or even the, the standard, like a lot of companies just like they were like, hey, what are these video games thing? What is this video game thing? Let's just let's try to make some some games on it. And like we, re- I don't know that we've really had that sort of innovative spirit to just like try new things, like just yeah. try something, yeah. see if it works. You know what? If it doesn't work, you know, no no big deal. We'll try something else. And the thing I love about it too is it, indie games right now are like at this. It's about as sweet a spot as you possibly could get, where the cost of development, I think, is is coming down just with you know the, the you know the way you can get hardware to do development on um, the cost of getting it to someone. You've got so many options as to how you could get it to someone. You make something for a certain platform, and it's you know reasonably portable to multiple different platforms. It's like this perfect little sweet spot that yeah. they can get in, and and maybe the biggest one is the price point. Like right. you know, they can come in at like they don't. Have have this sort of mentality of we can only release games at sixty dollars a pop, so yeah. we got to make it worth that every time. They're like, you know, look, we're going to make a game, and Lots of then options we, exactly, yeah. we'll sell it at fifteen, we'll sell it at a dollar, we'll sell it, it'll be free to play with you know microtransactions, yeah. whatever. They can do whatever they want, and it's it's just like it's kind of a perfect storm of. Right. the time for indie games well, to just you know spin out of control that's, and that's what it means true. is th- th- there's no excuses is what it means this is the in the past excuses were barriers uh, that you know well I got this great game idea but now how do I get it made or what right. do I do right. if you if you're out there and you're listening to this and you have the the creative spark for something if you have the drive and the determination those channels are now open things are afforded to you that were never afforded in the history of this medium so it's really exciting to think about the possibilities with that and uh and you know if you're indie the time is now is is basically it. because i don't i mean i think it'll be a, a big component of the industry moving forward but I, I i think in in the life cycle of of creative mediums there comes and goes this kind of uh, emphasis on the independent developer on the on on the inter- independent creative entity there comes points at time not to say that they can't come back but right now there's a big focal point on that and and if you or listening to this and, and somebody who's been inspired or want to do that this is this is an awesome opportunity to do that We're heading into the next console generation and and hopefully beyond because it's a big part of our industry so now, enjoy have, the journey s- having said that though if your uh, if your big idea for an independent title is to do like a, a first person shooter based on like a space military you know thing, like <laughs> You but might you mechs. might have some competition there. If you're if you think about doing like a first person shooter in which you jump inside mechs and like f- fight around, like you might want to think of some new ideas. All right, guys. Well, we are coming up near the end of this week's skirmish, but first we have our battle cries of the week, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and start off with my battle cry, which is actually going out to the developers of the new Mad Max game. Hell yeah. Um, I think this is a kind of a cool thing. Like a lot of people noticed uh, when when you know, they kind of got their hands on uh, a playable demo. Uh, I mean, it wasn't as good as Titanfall, but it was a playable <laughs> demo that they had at E3, and um, they noticed that the characters did not have Australian accents. What? And and to be honest with you, I know it sounds like okay. Well, I mean, but that is like the, the character the Mad core, Max yeah. is. I mean, it's that's, absolutely that's, like that's one a James of the, Bond that isn't British. Ex- I, really, it, it, that's exactly what it is. And so a lot of people, you know, were kind of spoke up about it. And uh, t- the the good news is that they listened. And I think this is one of those great stories. This isn't like the Microsoft being like it was you know, Don beaten into final submission. Decision. <laughs> this wasn't like them being beaten into submission and just and, and begrudgingly like fine, we'll do it. But you guys suck, you That's know. That's right. Um, th- this is actually it's Christopher Sunberg uh, came out and he said, "Attention fans who want Max to have an Aussie accent in uh, the new Mad Max game, it shall be so. We admire your loyalty and you have been heard." I, I just think that's very cool. That's, that's like cool, you know, yeah. saying, "Hey, look, we hear you. We 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 get what you're saying now. You know what? We're gonna do. It. We're gonna make it happen. Not we're gonna make it happen. But hey, just you just remember when you don't get that cool American accent, you know." <laughs> You just you remember we did this, so don't. Meanwhile, come back and- Nolan North takes a trip to Aussie Land to practice. That's right, because <laughs> he does. <laughs> but anyway, I thought it was a, a, definitely that. a a good good news that uh, Mad Max was getting his accent back. There you go. 
All right, so uh, DK, what uh, what's your battle cry this week? Uh, my battle cry this week, TG and 3D, goes out to a GT original program called Seedlings. If you're a fan of Minecraft, and there's probably a lot of you out there based on the sales numbers. I see Minecraft in the news all the time. Minecraft surpasses 5 million, surpasses 6 million, surpasses 7 million on the Xbox, blah, blah, blah. A lot of people playing Minecraft. And so we have an original show, which I may or may not have mentioned at some point, but maybe when it first debuted. But anyway, I went back and revisited it recently and watched a couple of episodes with my kids. Uh, it's a cool show. I really just, it's just the, you know, not that it's on GT or anything, but it is. And also <laughs> on uh, Xbox Live Marketplace, you can check it out there through the GT app, the Game Trailers app. But if you like Minecraft, you should check out Seedlings because it's a pretty fun show based in the world of Minecraft and has a uh, you know unique characters and some some just some interesting uh, plot. Uh, you know, uh, the creative and the creative behind the plot is usually pretty good in each episode. Self-contained, you don't need to actually follow it. Uh, you could pretty much track it. It's not you know too in depth it's not 24 or anything like that uh, but anyway uh, props to Ian Hank and a lot of the guys behind that project over there at GT it's looking really good and shaping up well and doing really well well uh, it's, it's about Minecraft it's, it's not <laughs> looking really good let's be honest it's not it's not but uh, you know it's 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 uh, you know I'm glad that this I was trying to think of a block pun but it didn't really work out. So anyway, check out Seedlings on your Xbox 360 in the Game Trailers app or on GameTrailers.com and props to the team behind that uh, creative series. That's my battle cry. Enjoy it. Very cool. Very cool. Yes. Uh, Brent, what is your battle cry this week? I have got a couple of PSAs for everybody. Uh, you probably already know this, but uh, I'll go ahead and take the time to remind you in case you've forgotten. Uh, first up is the fact that the new episode of The Walking Dead 400 Days is coming this week. It'll be out on iOS, PlayStation Woo. Network, Xbox Live Arcade, and of course on PC as well. Uh, the choices that you made in the first season of Telltale's amazing Walking Dead game will be carrying over into 400 days and also Telltale has revealed that uh, some of the starring characters, at least the ones that survive, may in fact be appearing in the upcoming second season of nice. The Walking Dead. So uh, that is the first PSA. I'm very excited about this. I loved the first season of The Walking Dead and I'm really anxious to, uh, to get more content. So that is definitely a very good thing. Another yes, very is. good thing... Uh, this is actually a title we talked about last week, Gran Turismo 6. Remember, we told you that uh, the demo was going to be out on July 2nd, and as we record this, we are probably about 30 minutes away from the demo hitting PSN. Of course, by the time you hear this, it'll have been out for a couple of days, but I just remind everybody that Gran Turismo 6 is available to, uh, or the demo for Gran Turismo 6 is available to uh, to download and check out. It'll be a... Uh, It'll be uh, apparently uh, you'll see some uh, some time trial stuff from uh, Silverstone in the UK, the uh, the famous track there. So anyway, I'm anxious to check this out. Very very excited about GT6, and this is. Are you downloading it tonight? Of, oh yeah, oh yeah. As soon as uh, as soon as it's on the store, it shall be mine. Nice. Yep. So anyway, that's uh, that's it. Uh, remember to uh, look for those two. Remember to look for those two downloads this week. Good, good, day, good week to play the new GT6 demo too, because Top Gear started back this week. That's right, and UK Top Gear, not anything else that purports to be. What, top what gear. else? What else would there be? I mean, what else would you mean when you say Top Gear? Other than yeah, U no, UK Top sure. Gear. Yeah. All right, so DK, do you have our member battle cry? I do, TG in 3D. I have our member battle cry. It comes from should I know how to say this? Kai Caius Ren. Caius Ren. Yes, Caius Ren um, has our member battle cry this week, and it goes a little something like this. I think Jason Rubin had it right. The Microsoft versus Sony debate at the mo at this moment is interesting and makes for good news, but this is now. In three years, there's going to be a lot more competition from other platforms like Android, iOS, etc. In relation to Microsoft turning the 24-hour connection requirement on at a later date, it won't be able to do that, dude. Not technically, but legally. If they turn this on, tens of thousands of devices will effectively be bricked. These would be the ones that are only connected sometimes as they will see this as an offline device turning the, the connectivity on uh, would change the nature of the device and all customers could claim a refund or a class action lawsuit I assume that would financially impact Microsoft so a little follow point. up to and I think the context I feel like that's of, a little armchair legal uh, yeah. but okay okay well, hang on right 
Uh, but but the, the, the point here is to think about what's happening now in context to the longer, bigger picture. And as you were saying, Tony, you know, I think they got back on track, they being Microsoft, uh, with the reversal of the policies. And, you know, a year from now, we're probably, I mean, it's going to be, oh, remember when kind of thing. But uh, I, yeah, and I still maintain, I don't even think it'll take a year. Like, I really think about a month from now, honestly, we, we will. Before they launch, you think so? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Absolutely. Okay. Time will tell. Yeah, we'll definitely find out. But no, I think he definitely has a good point, I, at least in terms of the, you know, the competition thing, agreeing with Jason Rubin. Uh, I, I think uh, I think you will definitely see more competition. Now, I do sort of question whether I think that competition will be the same. You know, like I think it'll sort of be the way the competition, like say the Wii was to the uh, to the PS3 and Xbox 360 last time. Let's be honest, they were not playing in the same Yeah you know, leagues and not, not even say like that one's more important than the other. They were just in different spaces. Like they sure, just, you know, yeah. kind of did different things. Right. And I think that, you know, we, with, you know, we've got things like the Ouya, you know, which just got uh, officially uh, released to retail here uh, this last, or about a week or so ago. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll sort of see if devices like that can really make an impact. I think you'll definitely always see the impact from like the Androids and the iOS and things like that for that kind of that casual and, and even so, sort of non-casual, but just like that portable gameplay. Right. I still think that well, the consoles are going to have a, a, a I think they're going to kind of have that home experience when you sit down and sit in front of a TV, even three years from now. But, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll definitely uh, see. I agree. I, th- I think I think that they do have the immediate fe- the immediate future locked in for the most part but you know i I do think that it's a changing landscape and and as we look farther down the road it it could get a lot more diverse uh relatively quickly sure one of the things that i would point to is the fact that you know there was news this week that google is now looking at doing their own android based game console and i think another pretty major thing is that at the apple worldwide developers conference apple officially introduced a um they officially introduced, I, I guess, a specification yeah, for, like a, for yeah. hardware developers to make gamepad peripherals exclusively designed or specifically designed to work with games on iOS. So, Interesting. you know, as Gabe Newell, uh, you know, famously said that, you know, Apple was... The I'm hungry! That, <laughs> <laughs> as, uh, as Newell said that Apple was the company he really had his eye on, um, you know, it, it'll be, and obviously, you know, wherever Apple goes, Google is likely to compete. Yeah. So, um, Let, let's be fair though. He has never had his eye on an Apple. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I do think that, I do think that both Apple and Google who have a very strong presence, as Tony would put it in another league right now yeah. with iOS and Android and the, and the portable gaming that they have, if they decide though, that there is some some money to be made in this kind of home console business, they're yep. going to be there, and they're going to be there soon. And I agree that it's not going to necessarily upset the game maybe over the course of the next three years, but looking farther you know, down the road from that, it, it could change the landscape pretty dramatically. The, the one thing I could see that I actually do think that is something we I think we will see, maybe not quite to what I'm about to say, but the thing I do think we'll see down the road, that could really encroach on, I think, the kind of area you're sort of uh, alluding to is the fact that like you look at something like the Ouya, you know, the Ouya, if you take the controller out of it, you know, it's, is essentially $50. Yeah. You know, they sell the whole, they sell the console for a hundred, the controller is 50 bucks separately. So 50 bucks for this piece of hardware. It's yeah. got a quad core, uh, Snapdragon, is that right? Or something like that. I mean, it's, you know, it's got a, a decently powerful processor for like mobile tablets right now. What is to say that, you know, they're bringing out tablets and phones every year, sometimes three and four times a year, if you're, you know, Samsung. Like, they, they bring out multiple devices per year. What's to say that they couldn't just bring out a new $50 console every year that has upped graphic power, upped processing power, upped feature sets, you know, all that sort of stuff. And, I mean, let's be honest with you, if you could buy a new console every, you know, year that had updated graphics and more powerful hardware for mm. like 50 bucks. Now, yeah. I mean, if it's like a new console every time or like a new graphics card for your computer, that's going to be three, you know, two, three, four, five hundred dollars, how much you want to spend. That's one thing. But when it's the cost of like a game, I could really see people maybe start to do that because they do sure. that with their phones now. They do that with their that's tablets true. now. So, um, and, and, you know, there'd always be some backward compatibility and stuff like that. But I'm sure that would um, kind of be a sort of a thing where certain games would just have, 
settings that play better on the new model until till that becomes the predominant model and then the next one comes along or whatever but yeah. I, I could definitely see that and i actually would be kind of for that because that's a that's a, a smaller expense something i could very much see myself doing once a year versus like having to buy a new console or a new graphics card every two to three years you know mm-hmm. yeah it's an interesting point we'll see what happens. it is yeah I was, I was glad to see Jason Rubin had plenty of time on his schedule to make that comment. All right. Um, <laughs> all right. So that is going to do it for this week's skirmish. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this week. And please join us once again next week when we will be mercilessly cleaving the fat from the gaming stories of the day. For Brent Adams and Daniel Kaiser, I'm your host, Tony Grice. And remember, cry havoc. And I, do either of you guys play Minecraft? No. No. I've never got Minecraft. Like, I mean, I get it. But I don't no. get it. I don't get it. I, yeah. I just watched a video where they added horses. Like, okay. I just watched, like, a 10-minute video where they essentially said, like, we got yeah. horses, and they now you can They added horses, have colored, and I still say nay. Yeah. Colored. <laughs> I was going to say they have colored clay. Yeah. You could have waited to say that, and it would have been... And a, then it would have rhymed, too. Yeah. I've got Ooh. a good friend that plays Minecraft a lot and mostly spends his time building his own kingdom of cocks. He just mm. makes incredible buildings and monuments in the shapes of penises. And, um, <laughs> that'd be a, you know, that'd be a perfect like, place to open up a hard. cock ring warehouse where you can get <laughs> all kinds of cock rings. I have to say that you know, after, after, after hearing these stories from him about that, yeah. it, it, it's, I, I've gone somewhat limp on the whole idea of playing. 